I was doing guitar lessons every single day. I thought I was, what's that guy from Whiplash? I thought it was gonna be like that, like boom, ding, 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 ding. like, you know, I can play the guitar now and I just can't do it. <laughs> Hello everyone, it is time for a brand new edition of Collider Ladies Night and you already know how thrilled I am for this one because I am a huge fan of Winmi Masaku and she is joining me for today's episode. Hello, how you doing? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing very well right now. I'm, I'm just so excited to talk to you about all your new projects and also get a clear picture of like your journey to all this stuff and, and what inspired you to begin with. So the film that I can only like give any credit for is Annie because I watched it like religiously every night after school, um, much to the dismay of my family. Um, and then um, I went off to college. I did maths, further maths, economics. Oh, that's high school for you guys. Um, maths, further maths, economics and chemistry. Dropped chemistry because I figured out if I dropped chemistry, I could be in the same drama class as this boy in my class and that's where the kind of love <laughs> I'm joking um, but <laughs> I, I'd always loved performing I had a I was in a girls choir from age seven and I just loved performing and yeah and then I basically when it was time to go to university I was going applying for maths and economics and um I was just like oh this doesn't feel right and I started having like panic attacks and really bad insomnia and I really just didn't, I was like, this isn't, just doesn't feel right, mom. And my sister was like, what feels good? And she, and I said, acting. I said, oh, how do you become an actor? I don't know. So we Googled every single person from the cast of Annie. <laughs> and Albert Finney, he's from Salford, Manchester. And he went to RADA. And that's how I heard about drama school. That's heard, how I heard about RADA. And... I applied and I had one shot. We could only afford one audition for one school. And my mom said, if it doesn't work, you have to go to university and do maths and economics. And I got in. <laughs> that is, that's wild. When, when did your family, so it seems like your family was on board when you discovered that passion and that need to create in that sense. But when did, I don't know, you do something like on stage, on screen that made them say like, huh, like this is the real deal. She's got it. Um, I did play in this church hall when I was like 12 called junk. And it was like about kids who ran away from home to take heroin. I just don't, it was not age appropriate at all. And, um, <laughs> um, what was the writer called? But anyway, it was in this church hall and everyone came to see it and everyone was really like, complimentary and then the writer came to me I can't remember his name now um what's his name um he came up to me and he said oh wow you were so much like Ronnie I can't believe that you're only like okay maybe I was 13 he's like I can't believe you're only 13 like you did such a good job of like playing this adult telling people kid not to take drugs <laughs> and I was like oh did I oh great <laughs> So I guess that was a moment that was like, everyone was like, oh, well done. Um, yeah, it was a very, it was a very heavy play. <laughs> I feel like whether you were 12 or 13, it's a heavy subject matter one way or the other. I don't know who picked that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so you have all of these moments of motivation. You get into this school program, too. But what happens when you leave like the safety of school and it becomes that point where it's like, you gotta, you gotta make it in a sense in order to make it a career. Was there any kind of, I don't know, like a new source of fear that came in at that point? Oh, absolutely. Because I mean, I had no one to kind of look up to in who, who had done it before, like that I really truly knew. But the great thing about RADA was that they do this buddy system. So when you're in your third year, you get buddied with someone who left RADA not too long ago and someone who left RADA a really long time ago. So I was buddied with Tanya Moody. She's a Canadian actress who graduated maybe like 10 or 15 years before I did. And yeah, they kind of give you advice, tell you, know, tell you what to kind of expect. And 
Um, but Tanya was invaluable to me because, well, first of all, like I stayed on her couch for a couple of months after <laughs> when I was really struggling. And I was like her babysitter for a while. Um, she's a black actress. Um, you know, so I had a lot of like, you know, she, I, she had a lot of guidance and help and, um, yeah, just, she was just great. Like I really needed her. She was like a big sister, like a, yeah. And she still is. Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like Hollywood in general should adopt this buddy system. I feel oh, like it's great. All better collaborators because of it. Yeah, and actually, you think you realize that the RADA community is quite tight knit because of it. Because actually, when you're in school, you have a buddy system as well, but but it's only between the three years. So first, you have in your first year, you have a second and third year, and you're in your second year, you buddy someone in the first year, and then you have your third year in buddy. Um, so it's quite good because you actually feel quite interconnected and I do feel like the, the RADA does feel like kind of a small world in a way because one way or another we are connected to other years and um, I like that. I do like that. Have over, over the course of your career, have you ever run into like a young up and coming actor that you find yourself like tapping into those buddy instincts for? Well, I was a buddy too. So I was buddy to Susan Wakoma and um, Ronke Adekalujo. Um, and then because of them, I was, I became like friendly with Pippa Bennett Warner and Cynthia Revo and Ivano Jeremiah. So that, just because they were all kind of in the same year, they weren't my buddies, but I kind of became aware of them and became friendly with them because of my buddies in their year. So, you know what I mean? I'm like mildly obsessed with this concept. It's really great. I feel like every area of the industry, it's like, I want to go out and find a buddy now. Yeah, no, it's so good. I kind of think it's the same kind of, it's like the internship thing. You kind of have someone ahead of you who kind of can just give you advice, point you yeah. in the right direction. And yeah, it's great. It's really, really great. I feel like with, uh, you know, like film school or maybe it's the same with, with studying acting in a, in a more formal program like that, there's always that question of like, you know, do I pay all that money to study in a program or do I go out and get real world experience? And like having, having done that, I would think, I would say the best part about film school was the community and the connections that you build like that. And I, I don't think, you know, when you're first starting out, you can get that, qu that quickly anywhere else. Yeah, that's really important. I I think that's one of the amazing things about drama school is your community within the acting community. And then also RADA, and I'm sure a lot of other drama schools have like um, the stage, um, uh, what do they call it? Oh, God, it's been so long. I graduated like 11 years ago. I'm just trying to think. I'm very busy with a lot of stuff right now. <laughs> yeah, the technical, the technical stage um, people. So like the designers, the costume designers, um, hair makeup. So I, you know, I felt really connected to a lot of areas of the industry and rather also had takes on, well did, I don't know if they still do, they took on two directing students every year as well. So then like, you know, I, you know, I'm really good friends with Nadia Latif and it's kind of good because you do feel like you have a community when you leave drama school um, of people who are kind of in the same boat or yeah, it's good. Support systems are very, very important, especially when I bring up this next point, because I do find that talking about setbacks, bumps in the road are very valuable to somebody else out there who might be experiencing the, it themselves. The one that I came across for you, I'm really curious to know what that was like going through, is what happened with Ruins, where you get that role, but then you wind up having to let it go because of an injury. And I don't know, I, I just imagine that it's really tough to go through something like that when it's completely out of your control. Oh my God, that was painful. That was one of the most painful experiences I think I had as an actor. But I actually am really grateful for it because it put everything into perspective. There are lots of people who can do your job as well, if not better. And Pippet Benno, Bennett Warner was amazing in it. And I, I went to see it and I was so like enamored by the whole show and I was heartbroken yet also like wow it's amazing I, it did it did what it needed to do for me as a person learning about the Congo and um yeah so that was painful um yeah and I was so young and I was like I don't care if I I don't care if I re-injure myself just give me the job and now like of course especially now in a global pandemic you realize how 
important your health really is and how dangerous sets are, how dangerous like, you know, you know, stages are like, you know, going from light to dark on a stage is dangerous. So there's all these things that I learned in that, in that one instance, like, you know, a lot of growing up was done in that moment, like in a lot of acceptance, which wasn't uh, my strong point <laughs> at that time in my life. And um, I really, really, really was sad. <laughs> I was just really sad. I was like, I feel like I'm missing out. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, but it was an amazing show. Like, it really was. And yeah, it was amazing. I'm glad you could look back on it that way. I do oh, have to see it. I was like that first, the opening night, I was like, I have to see this show because I loved everyone in it. I loved the story. I just loved it. Just loved it. I feel like you're only going to get so far in this industry if you don't have that healthy balance between drive for yourself, but also the ability to be happy for other people. Yeah, but I think that was a turning point for me because I'm not sure if I, like, before that point, like, not getting a job, I would cry and cry and call my mom and cry. And then, then it was like, I lost it. I had a job and then I lost it and it was completely out of my control. And it was like, because of an injury, I just... I, I, but I, it's not me, it's not me, it's this, it's me, it's not me. Um, and um, having to let that go, I think I really, I've, I don't think I've cried over a job since. <laughs> and I, if I don't get a job, I'm like, okay. Was there a specific thing that had you kind of like snap out of it and, and move on from that? Well, because you don't deserve anything. You'll give, you'll get what you're given. It's, it's life. And you know, that, you know, Pippa really truly was amazing. And it's like, well, why did I have that role in the first place? Anyway, it wasn't, it wasn't mine in the first place. It was always hers. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It was, it was always meant to be hers. And it's just, a, I don't know. It was just always a, it was just a lesson. It was just a, yeah. Oh, it's like, it's really moving to hear that. You know, like looking back and, and going through something like that and feeling feeling that way. Is there any particular job you booked after that that kind of gave you that source of confidence? Like, all right, you know, I got past that. That role was hers, but now this is mine. There's a part of you that's like, I only believe I've got the job when I'm, you know, in line at breakfast, having my first breakfast on set. But then, you know, I was just on a job and a pandemic hit. And so you're like, well... What happens now? <laughs> like, who knows? I'm to one of the most superstitious people in the world, I will not like verbalize an opportunity until it is set in stone and I have done it. Yeah, I, I made that mistake once. I remember talking about a film that I had auditioned for. I got, got had an interview and I was like, and I thought I'd done my best, my best in the audition. And I thought, and I sent, mentioned it in the interview, like, oh, I just auditioned for this job, but I really, really hope I get it. And I didn't, obviously. I mean, of course I did it because I just told the world about it <laughs> like it was mine. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, I've, I've been there too often and it gets stuck in your head, but like ultimately it means nothing. Right. Deep down I know it means nothing. Right. So another thing that I really wanted to ask you about was all of your opportunities with the BBC and their content. And I don't know if this is the way it, it works in the industry there, so correct me if I'm wrong, but is it a situation where like you make so many films and shows with them and then the idea of like breaking into Hollywood feels like a leap from that? Or is there, you know, like a natural transition that happens? I definitely feel like the BBC have really nurtured me and I, they, I'm so thankful to them because they gave me so many opportunities when other people just wouldn't. And I do feel like a, um, that they're like, uh, you know, you're, they're like your aunt. They're like, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to like, you can't go st stray too far. You can't stray too far because they're good to you. And, you know, and they've been good to you and they trust you. That's so hard to, to get in this industry. Um, being in LA and that was more of like, you know, everyone does pilot season because that's what everyone does. It wasn't necessarily 
a goal. It's like, I just want to work. I want to work in Australia. I want to work in South Africa. I want to work in Nigeria. I want to work in Germany. I don't care. I, don't, I just want to tell really good stories. So when you come to LA, there are so many scripts and so many possibilities. You're like, wow, like, oh, this script is cool. Like, let me please do, at least let me not mess up the audition because I really want to see this person again at, at the very least. Um, and yeah, so you just, I just, it just feels like a global industry that you kind of, you can't, say no to a certain like area because you know we watch Mad Men in the UK and you guys watch Shameless in in America and we watch all this you know we watch everything like it's it's global and um, so there's no you can't limit yourself like you can't limit yourself and um, you just got to try you just got to try and get the next good job you know that's it really so what would you say is the biggest difference between the two production wise and the way you shoot something for the BBC compared to, and I'm stealing Thad's words here, but a giant ass American production, like an HBO series? The biggest thing I can tell you is time. UK, we do like 10, 12 days. I think it would be similar to that if there wasn't so much special effects. It was just huge. Like the pilot was, I think, I think it was a six week shoot. I think so. I think it was a six week shoot for one hour, you know. <laughs> but the, the important thing is, is that all of that time and all of that resource, all the resources it takes, you could see it on screen and you can. <laughs> you really can see it like yeah even down to like making costumes like every so many of us have things custom made for us for a scene that might even be you know a 30 second scene and then we're into the next you know costume and um, it's huge like yeah i would say time resources i think are uh, you know they just it's just and i've only really done for the BBC like dramas and like Luther has special effects in a way like with the prosthetics and stuff like that but it's not you know green screen or anything like that so I've really only done like people in a room talking figuring shit out <laughs> I mean that like couldn't be further from what I saw you do in Lovecraft Country. I can't wait to get to that. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dig into a very specific episode just yet, but I wanna go from the idea of shooting a giant HBO series to what it was like for you stepping onto massive franchise sets like Fantastic Beasts and Batman vs. Superman. Did all of your experience kind of tee you up for that? Or when you stepped out there and saw all this, was it still like, holy shit, I can't believe I'm here? Oh, yeah, it was definitely like, holy shit, I can't believe I'm here. And you just have to talk yourself through it. Like, you have every right to be here, just like everybody else. You're a professional, you know what to do. <laughs> I had to have a few words with myself through Batman and Batman vs Superman and Fantastic Beast because I just, I don't think I'd ever been on a set like that before, actually. I don't think I had. Um, yeah, like I had done films, but like something like Philomena, it's again, it's kind of similar to the BBC in sense. It's people talking, it's people figuring stuff out. It's like emotional, but it's not, there's no, I don't think there was an ounce of CGI in Philomena, you know, but, um, <laughs> you can never know though. Are you sure? He is also, is always hidden where you don't see it. And that's also the sign of very good visual effects. <laughs> it's true. When I, when I saw on the, um, BAFTA, um, television craft awards, some of their nominations, I was like, the crown, what, what does the crown have for their special effects? And then I realized, oh, None of those things were real. <laughs> it, it blows my mind all the time when I see stuff like that. 
I also wanted to ask you about working with Zack Snyder specifically, because one of the things I admire about him most as a filmmaker is his kind of next level visuals. So can you feel that from the actor perspective that he is just kind of, you know, like framing a beautiful shot around you? I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the, the stuff around me actually. Now I'm thinking about it. And it's interesting because he's very personable and very like, we had some real, I wasn't on that set very long, but we had some really good conversations. He's a good person. And like, he gave me some good advice. But I really felt like it was about the character, actually. I didn't feel the, the whole scope of it at all. It was, and I think that helped with the nerves because he would give me like acting notes. He wouldn't say like, oh, you're, it looks like this. Remember to do this. You need to be, you need, you need to match the set, the setting or whatever. I actually don't, didn't feel that actually at all. And that really is a credit to him because Sometimes you have directors who make you fit into their, like what they have in their mind and they only, they only care about the shot. I, I don't, and he gave us time. There was a scene with Holly Hunter and we had time to work it out. Like I was like, wow, I, have, I really thought this was gonna be maybe an hour shooting and we really, worked out all the ins and outs of the character and where we're, where we've been, where we're going. Like before we even blocked the scene, we were on it for like an hour and a half, two hours. I was like, wow, I just, he gave us time. It, did, it wasn't about, I'm sure, I mean, it obviously was cause that's what you see too. Like it obviously was about the shot, but it wasn't, I didn't feel that from him. I felt, I felt guided through it. Definitely. Moving on now to Lovecraft Country, I find that current events often amplify certain themes and ideas in a show, movie, you name it. What would you say is the biggest difference between your take on this material when you were first pitched the show versus how you feel about it now given current events? Are there any things that stand out to you more now? Yeah, I guess the idea of the necessity of community. That wasn't something that I had like really paid too much attention to. In my head, racism was an issue that needed to be fixed by the racists. Like you needed to convince that person one at a time rather than a systemic thing that needs a whole group effort and you know this thing about Lovecraft Country it is like a team effort it's an ensemble piece it really is like you know they're fighting these monsters that are metaphorical and actual um, and it's a team effort I think that's how that's the that's the awakening I've come to over the last few months that I didn't, I, I wasn't thinking like that a year ago. I wasn't thinking this is, this is everyone, you know, it's the anti, the anti-racist movement that wasn't, I don't know why I didn't think of it like that. I thought it was up to those people to change rather than all of us changing everything together and, 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 and yeah. And what are, you know, yeah, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't, I don't know. That's how, that's, that's all I, that's why I don't know if I answered your question. I don't know. No, if you, I did. you definitely did because, you know, I'm only five episodes in, but I can most certainly feel the show tapping into exactly what you are explaining. And I, I think that's a big part of the reason why. I can't wait to see this story, see the story through. I think it is just something, something else right now. Yeah. I want to ask a little bit about shooting the pilot in particular. I was talking to, uh, to Courtney a couple of months ago and he told me that you guys had to, to retool some of it. So what was that production process like for you? And is it something that feels different from other pilots you've shot before? 
I wasn't actually part of the reshoot at all. Um, so I can only go on what I experienced during the pilot, which was, I mean, it was, it's really strange because there's, it's, my memories of the show are filled with joy and love, but obviously the themes of the show are so um, dark and painful. So it's really interesting. I kind of, um, I have such fond memories, but then I have to remember that the topics are, the, the bigger themes are so necessary and so important right now that sometimes, yeah, you just, you sometimes just enjoy because you want to be joyful. And, you know, I'm in the pilot with, I'm, my scene is the, 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 um, the street party and it, it truly was joyful. Um, yeah, it really was. Um, I mean, at 4am I got a bit tired, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I have great memories of that pilot and, the whole you, shoot, you feel the joy of that scene too. I like felt super greedy in that moment. I'm like, I just want to hang out here for a little longer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so one of my favorite qualities of the show overall is that I find that each episode kind of taps into like a different, I guess, genre or subgenre in a sense. So when you're working on a series and you kind of want to get used to like the way things are flowing, did you find that each episode felt like like its own individual shoot or were you still able to get into the groove despite the different genres, tones, and I guess like monster gore scenarios? Yeah, I mean, you definitely feel that each episode is different, a different world. It kind of focuses on a different person um, or a different like scenario or they have a different goal. But like for Ruby, I'm just not needed as much because the story's going another way or, but um, I felt like the, the arc of my story felt really like, I, I felt completely in it. Like I never left Atlanta. Like I was there the whole time I was needed for every, you know, all the time. So I wasn't, I didn't feel like, oh, this is, this is them over there. You know, I didn't feel like that. Um, cause also I was also doing my singing all the time, my guitar lessons the whole time. I, so I was always, I was always at base. I was always on set because I was always doing something. Wait, did you, did you take some of the guitar and singing lessons for, for the show or were you kind of doing that for fun in between filming? Oh no, that's the guitar I learned on. Um, I don't play the guitar. I still, I still Sadly, don't. And I feel bad because I really, I was doing, I was doing guitar lessons every single day. I thought I was, what's that guy from Whiplash? I thought it was going to be like that, like, boom, ding, ding, ding. like, you know, I can play the guitar now and I just can't do it. <laughs> I mean, I can play the songs every, like I could play the song, but I don't think I could do it, do it now. And um, the singing, I always, you know, I sing, but I, I hadn't found that side of my voice yet. So I had singing um, lessons like every, I mean, I think at least every other day. I'm, I'm sure it's a very big answer, but like in your singing lessons, if you had to give one tip that you learned that helped you tap into what you didn't know you were capable of, what would it be? Let loose, let go, stop worrying. You'll find your way back. <laughs> All right. I've seen five episodes and I am so grateful to have shows like this that deal with those kinds of topics because I feel like, you know, especially from a different perspective, entertainment like that makes you feel and understand things you might not have been able to otherwise. And if, if that's one of the ways that I can access that, I'm glad a show like Lovecraft Country exists because I, I think we all need it. Yeah, and Misha doesn't pull any punches. Like she really is unapologetic of all the the highs and lows of the emotions that our characters go through, um, as women, as black women, as men, as black men, as 
white women, you know, like there's the patriarchy, you know, there's so much that she has explored the depths of and the heights of. And yeah, um, it's so unbelievably necessary to, because I feel like she's done it in a way that hasn't got the, the, you know, the censorship. She hasn't censored herself. I censored myself all the time. I found, I've realized I am very rarely honest outside of my family. I'm very, very rarely honest when I step outside of the door. I feel like I present the way I need to be, pre I need to present in order to survive and feel like I can navigate. But it's, it's a, an energy that I put into it's an energy I put into navigating the world that I'm not putting into myself. I'm not putting into my artistry. I'm not putting into my family, my friends, what my dreams and hopes I'm spending this energy paying attention, figuring out how to, to be in this world that doesn't feel like it's for me. And Misha has just said, no, this is it. Like, we're not pulling any punches. We're not going to ask for forgiveness. We're not going to, we're just going to, I'm just going to say it how I see it. Say it how I feel it. You know. Hands down, one of my favorite qualities of the show is how bold it is. Um, also, to what you just said, you are kind of expressing that and helping enlighten people through the content that you're making. Not just Lovecraft Country, but his house is also like a wildly effective way to get at that idea. And I cannot wait for that movie to finally arrive so everyone can experience that as well. Because we've needed all of these stories for a long, long time, but I am especially glad we're getting them right now. Yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, to tell this story in this way that Remy has is just, it's just brilliant. I mean, they're, the house is haunted, they are haunted, the past is haunted, the future is haunted. It's just, it's just a lot. Like we, you know, it's not, we're not just talking about emigrating, <laughs> you know what I mean? We're talking about refugees, asylum seeking, seekers, seeking a place of peace because they need to, they need a home. They aren't leaving because of nothing. They're leaving because of everything, because of the hope, because of safety, because of just for life, for their life to, to be what it, to be a semblance of what it should be, you know? And people, I think sometimes people just talk so easily about immigrants, immigrants and those people over there it's like, where's the community? Where's the heart? Where's the kindness? Where's the understanding? Like, who wants to leave home, really? Unless they have to. Like, you know, to take those jer that journey from Sudan to England is no easy feat. So many people will lose their lives along that way. So many people. And I just think people need to really understand and feel that, like, it's not a decision you take lightly. It's just not. Before I let you go now, <laughs> like a lighter, a lighter shift here, just a couple rapid fire questions so our audience can get to know you a little better. First, do you collect anything? Fabric. Fabric. I have a lot of fabric. <laughs> yes. what, what, do you make stuff with the fabric? Yeah. I, I, I made my own wedding dress. I made, I made flower girl dresses. I made my, make my husband a shirt for his birthday the other day. I love fabric. I just love fabric. I have a bookshelf almost filled with different types of African prints and kente and ofis. And I mean, I love fabric. <laughs> well, happy to have. If you could only have one meal for the rest of your life, and you had to have it over and over, what would it be and why? But, okay, will it make, will it make you really unhealthy? 
Can, can it just be like, you just like the taste and it doesn't make you huge? I mean, we're trying to cheat the system right now, but I'll, I'll let it slide. <laughs> you don't have to worry about the health factor here. <laughs> cool. It would be my mom's egg gussie soup and pounded yam. Like, I love, I love egg gussie. That's my, that's my jam. <laughs> oh, oh it could be Ethiopian food too. No, she'll hate me. If I say that. <laughs> no, I'll go with the egg gussie. <laughs> Let's go with, what is the last TV show you've binge watched? No, okay. I'm gonna. I'm not. I'm gonna lie because I'm not. I'm really ashamed. And the real one. The 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 real answer. No, I'm gonna lie. Um, I'm gonna lie. I'm gonna say it is Search Party. I watched Search Party from beginning to end in like four days, and I love it. I really do love it. And um, yeah, that that was a true binge. The the lie was just the thing I just finished the other day. Can I try, try to guess? Like, you see, you seem embarrassed by it. I feel like folks normally are embarrassed by in binging reality content. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna guess it's a reality dating show. Yeah, you could. I'm gonna narrow it down. The, the, here's where I might lose you though. Is it a Netflix show? Yes. I'm gonna make a guess here. You have to tell me if it's true. <laughs> is it too hot to handle? No. Is it Love is Blind? No. What's oh. <gasps> Which one? I just stumbled across um, Married at First Sight. I mean, we have it in the UK, but it, I just saw that you had it here and, I, and then I got hooked and one of the couples is still together and I was just like, I don't think that would have happened in the UK. I don't think any of them are together. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> You, if you like that, I, I have to recommend in particular Love is Blind. I think you're really gonna like that one. No, I can't, I promise myself I'm not watching another episode of them ever again. Cause like, <laughs> I gave myself Real Housewives of Atlanta and then I just weaned myself off it. And then for some reason, <laughs> for some reason, I just pressed play on Married at First Sight. Hooked, I was hooked. <laughs> That's what happens. I feel like on that note, I will leave you and I will say thank you so much for spending so much time with us today. It was, it's so nice to get to highlight more of your work and also to get to, to get to know you a little more and like where your source of creativity comes from and what's important to you. And congratulations on Lovecraft Country and his house and give me more stuff soon. I know we have to wait to make things safely, but give me more shows and movies. Oh, thank you so much. This is a delight.